first of all, thanks a lot for coming on, man. I appreciate it. Um, it's been a while since we uh, linked up. I think the last time we saw each other, I was down in, when I was still in Florida, right? Yeah, last. Yeah, I think that was about it when you were at the schoolhouse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how's things going? How you been since then? I good. Uh, had a couple of uh, setbacks this past year, but uh, getting better every day. So um, it's uh, it's interesting, man. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I remember now that you mentioned that, I for, forgive me for not mentioning it. Um, is everything going well with that? How's there, is everything? Yeah, going? dude. Right. And, you know, bottom line was I went to the doc, um, my primary care doc uh, for fighting the VA. And uh, he listened to my heart and said, dude, has anybody ever told you you got a murmur? And I'm like, yeah, fight docs told me once or twice. Put me on an EKG. Everything was good. And he goes, now nah, we're going to do some tests. And I mean, it was literally did the test, which was an echocardiogram where they do an ultrasound of your heart. And I got a phone call like three days later said, man, you got severe stenosis of your aortic valve. And I'm like, what? <laughs> so, um, you know, he said, I'm going to uh, recommend you to a surgeon and literally went into the surgeon because it's not an emergency, but you need to get this done. So December had my aortic valve replaced, uh, much like Chris Ban and uh, Tim Stamey. Mm. Uh, so uh, Chris paid me back well uh, because when he had it done, uh, Blair Evans, Charlie Heidel, and myself sent him a six foot stuffed cow and a t shirt with a heartbeat monitor or a heartbeat uh, graphic on it. It had a cow on it. So I got the same thing from Chris. So, uh, <laughs> but yeah, those two, man, Chris and Tim Stamey, uh, were great. I mean, they talked me through everything that was going to happen. And I, I can't thank them enough because it put me in the right mindset. Yeah. Yeah. They had to freak you out a little bit. I mean, it, they say it's routine, but. You know who knows? You know with the, with stuff like that. When anytime they cut into you, it's like a you know could go either way. Yeah, it was um, like I said, I, I did well. Um, as a matter of fact, me and my wife uh, about six days out of surgery walked a mile, and I'm like, I can't believe I'm six days out of open heart surgery. <laughs> and then next day, I woke up, put my watch on, and my heart rate wouldn't come down, so I had to go back in for. I went into AFib, which is normal for any time you go on a bypass machine and uh they had to shock me back into the rhythm but yeah since then man uh i took about a month off from work and went back to work uh my boss jokes he goes i still can't stress you out i'm like every time i see your phone number pop up on my phone you've stressed me out so <laughs> it's all good <laughs> well i'm glad everything worked out i'm glad you're doing well that was uh yeah. yeah anytime you hear about a buddy that has to do stuff like that you're always you know, on edge a little bit and you're hoping, hoping for the best. So I'm glad to hear everything's working out. Well, the bottom line, man, is, is for everybody that listens, you know, uh, we were the meatheads, the generation that would go to the dock and hide our stuff. You know, man, you got to take care of yourself. Um, listen to your body, listen to the docs and do what you got to do. So, yeah. Well, um, let's take it back. Let's, I, I'm curious to hear, um, uh, cause you got in. You came in a little bit before I did, so I'm always. I, I love hearing the stories about the the early days of like the tech B career field and that kind of stuff. So why don't we go back to when you first um, thought about joining the military? Tell me about that. You know, tell me about, a little bit about your childhood and what formed you and what kind of shaped you to, to get in the military. Well, interesting. So um, you know, not to give everybody a history, I was born in Waco, Texas. My mom and dad met when my dad was in the Air Force at. Uh, Airbase called James Conley Air Force Base, uh, just outside of Waco. It's now a uh, facility that L3 does modifications on aircraft. Uh, they still use that. So um, my dad chased contracts. He was an electronics tech for the Air Force. He got out, chased contracts. Um, we ended up back up in Waco uh, for a while. And then third grade, I moved to Louisiana. My dad took a job at uh Pittsburgh plate and glass chemical plant there. So typical childhood, played sports growing up. Uh, Sulphur was a great place to grow up. Uh, you know, still have friends there. Uh, go back every once in a while. But, uh, you know, I went to college. Didn't really have to study in school. My priorities were all jacked up. I was worried about chasing girls, drinking beer, trying to play ball and stuff like that. And, uh, Second semester, a letter came in the mail. And, you know, I, I, I tell this all the time. You know, it's, you know, the Animal House line, fat, drunk, and stupid is not a way to go through life. 
And my dad got the letter and he looked at me and said, you got two choices. He said, get a job or join the service. You're not living on my roof for free. Uh, best advice I ever got. Um, so I took a look at the service. I had a couple uncles that were, you know, retired Air Force, seniors and chiefs. And, you know, me and my dad kind of talked and he's like, yeah, you don't want to sit behind a desk, you know, growing up hunting and fishing. So literally went to the recruiter's office and flipped through the book and ran across this community called Tactical Air Command and Control Specialist. And I looked at the job description and it was like, 14 and a half weeks training in Fort Walton Beach, Florida. You learn how to navigate, live in the woods. And I'm like, okay, sounds good. So yeah. signed up, you know, showed up at basic training. Um, you know, my uncles and all them was like, there's no job like that in the Air Force. I'm like, well, the recruiter got me then. So, but um, I'll never forget showing up the first day. And we showed up our class that actually started that day. And they're like, we're going to see if we can get you in the class or, you know, you're going to have to wait. And it's like, God, just get me in the class. But yeah. Steve Bumgarner, rest his soul, man. Uh, I never remember Staff Sergeant Bumgarner saying, and he asked a question and me and another guy answered, sir. And he's like, beat your face. And it's like, <laughs> what the hell did I just get into? So, um, yeah, so, you know, went through the schoolhouse, um, it was interesting. As a matter of fact, when I showed back up at the schoolhouse as an instructor, uh, the students were living in the same dorm that I lived in. Really? Yeah. And, you know, it was like three showers working there and all that. So yeah. uh, it was an interesting time. Um, I'll tell one more story around that. So we were going through, I think it was block six at the time. It's where we'd learned to take a take apart the Mark 107s and 108s, put them back together. And the instructor, I believe his name was Sergeant Carter, left the room and said, you guys keep playing around. So we were playing around. And this was the day after Challenger blew up. So I'd been on the range because I was going overseas and everybody that was going overseas had to qualify again on weapons, uh, you know, so they showed up over there. Well, so, you know, they threw us all, you know, shut down the range early that day. You know, we got a half day off and next day we're in there playing around. Well, unbeknownst, one of the guys was putting together the radios and the old uh, 107 had a voice transmitting and receive plus guard. You know, we all thought the antennas were dummy. So he's sitting there cracking jokes on the UHF portion of the 107. Herbert Fields Tower recorded it and so did Eglin's. The Eglin uh, wing commander, or the general officer over there, lost a buddy on the Challenger. Oh, he's so, cracking jokes about the Challenger. Yeah. I oh. mean, yeah. dude, I just, I remember Sergeant Carter running back in the room, hitting all the emergency power switches and shutting them down. It's like, set your bleepity bleeps down. Next thing I know, Chief Nostine shows up in the classroom who was the superintendent of the schoolhouse with all the instructors and we got the you got 15 minutes to be on the pt field your other classes are free for the rest of the day and you know i mean i had struck instructors randy you know like randy long kleber you know all these guys and they showed up we had a guy in our class named cliff keely who they used to throw off the pull-up bar and PT started when Cliff Keeley dropped to his knees from being in the front lane and rest position. Yeah. <laughs> so next day, and I mean, they, they beat us up pretty good. Next day, uh, you know, we were told that the general was coming over. Oh, and I never forget the instructors like, dude, you better not crack a smile. I don't care how funny it is. So... You know, general comes in, lays into us, and as he's walking out the door, he looks at Chief Nostin. He goes, "Chief, I'm done with him. I don't care what you do with him." And Nostin's like, "You heard the man. Get back to the dorm, change back on the PT field." I mean, dude, we got beat for like two oh. weeks, but you know that was that was back in that time. You know, and um, those guys, you know, they had a job to do, and they did a great job. I mean. Uh, I look at the schoolhouse now, and it's uh, absolutely incredible where we started and where we are now. I oh, mean, yeah. You're training college athletes now. Oh, yeah. 
Um, yeah. So, but from there, man, went to Germany. Uh, first assignment was with Third Brigade Eighth ID in Mannheim. Um, you know Harry Oliver. Harry yeah. Oliver and a guy named Willie Thomas were my first two direct bosses. I actually was able to have dinner with both of those guys about a year ago in Full Long Beach, and um, I'll never forget Harry. You know, basically telling us when we walk, or telling me when I walked in the door, he goes, "You're one of 13 Air Force guys on this Army post, so you represent the whole Air Force. You stay squared away." And Harry and Willie shaped me. Um, I'll never forget Willie. One day I was going through my upgrade training, you know, typical Germany day, mist in the rain. He hands me a Prick 77 and says, your antenna is broke. Here's some WD-1. Do not come back in until you have comms with the air traffic control tower and the brigade command post. Um, went out, played around, got comms with them. I probably carried that antenna with me until I was a tech sergeant because yeah. it worked. So. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of guys get away from that now. I don't know how much, I can't speak to it, I, I, but it's something that isn't taught a whole lot, I don't think, nowadays, that whole uh, antenna theory. But I remember in tech school, it was like, that was a big, huge thing, like building, like, you know, um, what was that one with the head that, it was the triangle piece with the wood, and it was like the... Uh, oh, like the field expanding OE254 yeah, or yeah. 292. Yeah, yeah, 292, right, yeah. Uh, so yeah, so you, did, you were in Germany. Um, yeah, and I knew Harry Oliver. He was um, at the fifteenth when I got to Benning. If, uh, or no, excuse me, the seventh. We were all at the seventeenth together. Um, yeah, yeah, great dude, awesome guy. Yeah, I learned a lot from him. How long were you in Germany? So I was there two years that time. Um, you know, typical single single guy. You know, Germany assignment. Um, and I was. Um, looking to get married. So, you know, I wasn't going to plan on staying there. It was, like I said, it was a great two years. I mean, uh, you know, date myself a little bit more. I read Tom Clancy's Red Storm Rising sitting in my GDP position in the Bieberhof Bowl. And I'm looking at the data that he's got in this book on how in the world did you figure all this out? But, right. you know, I can remember doing exercises sitting, you know, I was with three, seven cab and the, um, I think it was third ACR was in that, no, it was 11th ACR at that time was had to fold a gap and, you know, like 24 hours into a exercise, they would be like, Hey, we're requesting a rear, rearward passage of lines with two deuce and a half and 12 guys. And, you know, it was as real as it can get, you know, at that point you're sitting there, you know, you're having fun. Don't get me wrong. I mean, we always made made sure we had all the guest house marked on the map and, you know, places to go eat chow and everything else. But, you know, I, one time, um, so, you know, we lost Matt Del Vecchio recently. Matt was a, um, was at Mannheim with me. Uh, and I was also, I was partnered with Todd Kessler, but, um, <laughs> We've been out partying, me and Matt and the other guys that lived in the dorms been out in Heidelberg partying and we came in. It was a Saturday night, so usually, you know, alerts would happen Monday morning or whatever. As we were walking in the door, we started to see, you know, the old blinky lights on the back of the vehicles across the street from us. And it's like, what the world's going on? All of a sudden the phone rings and it's, you know, our ALO, he's like, get in here. And we're like, I'm musser on a Saturday morning or you know, Sunday morning what's going on yeah. so we go in and he's like you know go draw your classified go draw your ice packs go draw your weapons and now all of a sudden the hair on the back of your neck standing up you go do that we drive our vehicles out meet up with the army unit you know pull into the army unit and the sergeant major leans, leans in and he, you could smell the liquor on his breath because he'd been out partying <laughs> And it's like, hey, we're uploading ammo, blah, blah, blah. You know, we got a briefing in 15 minutes. So, dude, 14 and a half hours in a track hungover is not pleasurable. But we ended up sitting in the bowl for probably two and a half weeks. There was a, a shuttle mission that was going up that they wanted to have people pre-positioned in case it went down for recovery. And they alerted the whole European theater. So... I mean, things like that, if you think back on them, you laugh. And, uh, but, it, dude, in the moment, you are uh, you could create diamonds. <laughs> right. Yeah, who knew? I mean, you had no idea what it could be. I mean, you thought, 
yeah. the Russians were coming across the border or something, you know, who knew? Yeah, then. exactly. Because that so, was, what year was that? That was... Uh, 86 to 88 was when I was there. Yeah, so the wall was still up. I mean, it was, there's, the Cold War was well and, you know, still going for sure. Yeah, you had yeah. Russian liaisons driving around, you know, on their vehicles, you know, trying to count vehicles. And, I mean, it was it was a different time. I mean, sure. um, you know, from a kid growing up in Louisiana, never being outside the States, you know, first time in Germany, it was pretty interesting. So. Yeah. But there, from there, I went to Fort Hood, uh, got married in, um, you know, during my leave, so my wife, um, who's still with me, I mean, we just celebrated 36 years. She will be oh, saying awesome. one of the days uh, from putting up with all the shenanigans, both in the military and out. Um, right. You know, we show up there, we get, we actually get very nice base housing, you know, blah, blah, blah. But my wife's quite the introvert. Um, in the first 36 months I was there, I was gone 22 months, either exercises, school, uh, deployments and all that. So she got a, she had a taste of the military life with not a lot of support. So, uh, pretty interesting life there. Yeah. Yeah. It's something you don't really want to have happen, but sometimes it works out that way. You're like, Hey, yeah, come on to the military. It's going to be great. And they don't know anything about, it. I mean, I don't know what her background was, but did she have any military background at all? Or was she, did she know what to expect or she had a couple of uncles uh, that were in a matter of fact, one of her uncles retired as a sergeant major out of the army, but oh, wow. you know, um, I asked her to marry me before I went to Germany and she told me no. And I joke with her now telling her it's the best decision she ever made, <laughs> uh, you know, but, um, yeah, it's, it was pretty interesting. Um, but like I said, I showed up at Fort Hood at that time. It was that one dash two six Oh second tactical air control wing. Um, two guys there that I remember, Dennis Steele was there. Another one, you know, rest his soul, Chuck mm -hmm. Holbrook, another one. Um, Chuck was one of the first guys Amy met, uh, when we got, you know, when we got there, but, um, uh, interesting, uh, cast of characters there. Uh, our ALO commander at the time was a guy that spent nine months in the Hanoi Hilton. Really? Um, yeah, so a guy named Bill Spencer, he was an F-16 pilot, was an F-4 pilot prior to that. Wow. No, uh, we were going to do some training one time, and I asked him, I said, would you talk to the guys? He goes, what do you mean to tell him? He goes, I got shot down. I landed on top of a hill. There was a stump there. I looked every direction I looked. They were coming for me. I had not much of a choice, and I'm just like, all right, sir, appreciate it, you know. <laughs> but uh, really, that was the most he ever talked about that whole time. Yeah. Um, yeah, like I said, we're there with Terry Langley and them. Um, so, you know, typical, you know, just train, 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 blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden, um, Saddam decides to invade Kuwait. So, um, we started prepping for that. I had no idea when we were going to go, but we knew we were going. So, uh, jumped over there with, the. uh, Armored unit, 367 armored commander was a guy named Doug Tysted. Um, they called him the Jolly Rancher commanders. Instead of giving out coins, if you did a good job, he'd give you a Jolly Rancher candy. <laughs> Dudes loved him. Um, we, uh, it was myself, Bill Dietz. I don't know if you know Bill. I don't think um, so. He was at the, the, he was at the 82nd for a while. And I think he retired up in Alaska. Uh, but Bill was my airman. Um, you know, just a freshly, you know, maybe a year or two experience as a JTAC. Um, that was a uh, interesting nine months um, for us. Uh, <laughs> we were out one day, or it was a nighttime, we had AC-130 show up. They wanted to do some training over our TAA. The only person we told was Colonel Tystead. And this is, you know, they were using their big, um, they were putting the burn down. Yeah. And, um, you know, we were in the center. It was just a, you know, a, a, a square formation, you know, with each of the companies out. And all of a sudden, you know, they're doing their wake up every 30 minutes doing a scan. And oh, the radio just explodes. <laughs> they're freaking out because it's like daylight outside all of a sudden. But it's pitch black. They have no idea what's going on. Right. 
well, we're just calling all targets within the formation. And the Colonel, the Colonel Tysta is just rolling laughing. He goes, I'll have to tell him about it tomorrow, but I won't let him set on edge for a while. <laughs> so, uh, was, yeah. so were they doing, uh, were they just checking your perimeter or what were they, did, did they, um, was this, no, we, it was a training, training up for them or. Yeah, they were just, you know, they were running dry runs out there. Uh, they would, you know, we stayed in touch with where they were coming out of. And it's like, hey, man, we've got formation spread over here. If you guys want to come, it keeps us, you know, operating and all that. Because you he, he sat there for quite a long period of time. I think we got there in October. No, maybe it was earlier than that. But we sat there until we kicked off, you know, until we moved up toward the border after the, you know, the air ward started. So, yeah. You had to do something to maintain. Um, they set up gunnery ranges. You know, we coordinated with the A-10s. We'd bring them in on the gunnery ranges. Uh, pretty impressive watching, you know, a company of tanks in line firing in volume maneuver. Um, saw that both in training and real life there. Um, yeah. So, I mean, our last battalion objective was the Avenue of Death. Um, we went through Ali Salim Airfield. Um, battalion lost one guy. He was our master gunner, a guy named uh, Whiskey, Harold Whiskey. Uh, he taken care of us. I mean, you know, we had a 113 track, had a brand new, and I'm not kidding you, this guy had been out of AIT six weeks when we deployed. Um, me and Bill used an antenna, you know, the top of an FM whip antenna with a ball on the top to communicate heavily when we needed to with this guy, because he liked to sightsee and <laughs> the day we went through the breach alpha company was on the right hand, uh, you know, the right of us. And one of their tanks hit an anti it hit a mount, hit a mine. I think it was an anti tank, but it blew the ballistic skirt like 60 feet in the air. And this kid's, we're driving through the breach lane, and this kid's like eyeballing over his shoulder, and it's like whack him on top of the head with the antenna. You know, your eyes are forward. Sure. I'll tell you when you can look someplace else. Right. But um, we lost whiskey when we got up to the Avenue of Death. We were in a, we got a pretty good fight up there. Um, you know, the Iraqis had just. They'd been setting still for a long time because anytime they moved the aircraft with whack them when we rode up, they, you know, they opened up with everything they had around there. They were trying to turn a 2S1 to fire directly on us and um, the battalion commander's tank put a Sabo through it and it burned for 24 hours. Um, but Whiskey got hit uh, that day and couldn't get a meta back in. He bled out. Um, so, you know, it's, it's pretty significant when, you know, you've gone through that whole time period and you lose one guy out of the battalion and the one guy you know, or the one guy is somebody everybody in the battalion knows. Yeah. So, um, and then, you know, after it was over, we were up, you know, the battalion commander was, duty. we, we led with the lead company of the, 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 of the battalion and his orders to me is, you know, you're never more than 25 meters off my right or left flank. Um, but we, before we got to right after, right before we got to Ali Al Salim, there was, um, we got in another fight and, um, you know, we started to form back up to move out. And in the middle of the formation was like the, uh, ADA guys, the, uh, fisters and all that. And I'd never forget Bill Dietz going, what the hell is that? And I turn around and I look, you know, I was looking off to our uh, right flank and you could see a couple of BMPs and stuff. They looked whole, but they weren't. Mm. Well, the guys in the middle of the formation had saw them and started firing their 50 cows across the formation and rounds were bouncing and hitting our track. Oh, my God. And Jeez. I remember watching Tysted's tank turn the turret. And, you know, if you've ever seen an M1 lock on a target, it, the, the muzzle bounces mm -hmm. i remember this call like it was yesterday renegade six this is hound six hound six this is renegade six over renegade six if you fire that weapon again without my permission you will cease to exist hound six out 
The next oh call was he called our call. He gave us a call sign of Porcupine because of all the antennas on the track, and he's sure. like, "You know, hey, Porcupine Six, are you okay?" Roger said, "We're good." We had the only operational GPS. He's like, "Where the hell are we?" Yeah, give him <laughs> coordinates, and all right, let's move. And it, dude, it was just—I mean. You think about it, the Army hadn't been in a fight other than Grenada and Panama with armor in how many years? Yeah, exactly. So, but I mean, there was the one other story there is we were, it was after the ceasefire. We were, we set road, roadblock positions up around the entrance, you know, the big, um, Cloverleaf interchange going into Kuwait City, and we're checking people coming in and out. And we were up visiting, I think it was Alpha Company again. We were up visiting them, and um, all of a sudden, just all hell breaks loose. You know, 60s, 50s, you know, coaxes on the tank are firing, and there's this 18 wheeler that is blown through the roadblock. And it finally stops, and Dietz and I. We're pretty close, so we ran up, pulled the driver out, put him in a you know in a, a hold down position, and then um, you know we start trying to figure out what it was. Well, it was a Kuwaiti family that had fled, and they were trying to get back to their house. In the back of the truck were two girls, probably three to five years old, and their grandfather. And out of all those rounds that went through that eighteen wheeler, only the grandfather was hit. But, you know, I, at Amazing. that point I had a, I had a little girl back home yeah. and, you know, that kind of was like, wow, the family was just trying to get back to their house in Kuwait city. Did the grandfather make it or did he, did he pass away? We, I don't know. Uh, we had medics there and we backed him out, but, um, I mean, he was, he was tore up pretty good. So yeah. thank God those girls didn't get hurt though. Man. Yeah. And I mean, that's, I can't believe the driver made it. Like that's the main thing you're everybody should have been focusing on was his, you know, that cab of that truck and he made it too. Well, I remember the uh, the Alpha Company first sergeant, we had to restrain him. He was ready he was ready to kill somebody because he he was on the roadblock at the road uh, at the checkpoint. Mm. Dude, he came screaming down there and it was like one of the biggest dudes in the company grabbed him and was just, you know, picking him up and turning around, pushing him away. Cause he was, he was reaching for his 45 and it's like, you can't do that, man. But, <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> you know, so, um, so what, what's this about the, your ALO vol, uh, told you to oh, escort somebody or something? What is this? <laughs> yeah. So we were, we were hanging back. And I, again, I go back to these guys have not, you know, I mean, they've had three days, four days of, you know, fighting. So they're trigger happy at this point. Anything that moves, you know, we heard toes kick off around us and all that. So our ALO volunteers us in our track to take this uh, Kuwaiti officer back to Ali Asalim Airfield. <laughs> Dude, we bypass minefields. This is at night, too. So he's like, we bypass minefields. We got to cross over. Not only our battalion, but two other battalions to get to Ali Salim. And, you know, it's like five kilometers down the road. The, the pavement ends. Now it's all desert. And, you know, we started going and we, we hit the end of the pavement. And the track driver's like, are you sure about this? And I'm like, no, turn the vehicle around. <laughs> and we come back and the ALO's like, just he was a captain out of Panama, you know, the OE 37. He's like, This is you're embarrassing me. I'm like, Sir, if you want to take him that bad, you jump in the track and take him. But <laughs> right. you know, there's no he can wait until daylight to get back to Ali Asalim. What's he going to solve in 12 hours? You know, right, we've right. been in this whole position, you know, for three days now. It's not nothing that critical that you're going to risk fratricide, you know, all this going on. So it was just typical Balo trying to make men's with the army. Yeah. yeah. So he wanted, it was just your track, your one, one, three, just alone and unafraid through me, the desert. Bill Deeds, me, Bill Deeds, this, um, I don't even remember what he was, a colonel or something and our track driver. 
I mean, there could have been minefields, kind of like you said. There, I mean, it could have been anything out there. And then, we, yeah, just a, a vehicle moving through the desert at night, passing through line, you know, friendly lines. Yeah, that's always that's crazy. <laughs> yeah, like I said, you know, those dudes on their thermals, you know, we've been moving. I, I think this was well, it was after we'd been moving for four or five days, you know, on like two, three hours sleep at that. I yeah. mean, dude, my fifty cal felt like a feather pillow. I remember one time waking up you know, laid my head down on it and Bill, you know, hits me in the head and goes, they left us. And, you know, you can look up and you can see a cloud of dust and it's like, oh crap, let's go. <laughs> let's burn this track up. Right. What, um, you said something about Bill Dietz's admission. What, what's the, what's that story? Oh, so <laughs> we actually, so they were, um, they were trailing the tanks back into the mine to redeploy them. Mm -hmm. um, so they had no comms that would reach from Kuwait city all the way back to the So we set up an HF network. Nice. So we had checkpoints to monitor the convoys and all that. So Bill and my Bill and that ALO stayed up where our last position was and me I forgot who it was, me and somebody else, I think it was Sweda, went down to Damon and set up there. And then we had a couple others, you know, the whole brigade was doing this. Mm -hmm. And you know, we get ready to get on the airplane to fly home. And, you know, at that time when you showed up there, there was like rows of dumpsters for amnesty boxes. And it's like, if you get caught with anything, you're staying here and you're going to be court-martialed. So throw your crap away. Well, we're standing there getting ready to get on the airplane and Bill's like, Hey, uh, I got something I want to tell you. And I'm like, what's that? He goes, well, you know, one day we were on shift, you know, after we got off shift on the HF side, we went exploring, you know, there's dead tanks all over the place. And you know, we went exploring and uh, we got up on this T-72 and, you know, I jumped off and I found this, thing in the ground and I picked it up and he goes, I think it was a rock eye. He goes, but it didn't have any fins. And he goes, I kind of, you know, dug the sand out of it and blah, blah, blah. And he goes, I was walking off, you know, it was time to go. And I was walking off and I threw it over my shoulder and it exploded. Oh. And dude, I lost it. I'm like, dude, we've been here for nine months. You know, we went through this whole thing and then you almost I said, you know, and Bill was new. It was a new way. I'm like, what would I have told you? You know, it was just one of those moments. It's like he, he felt like a kid waiting on his dad to get home. And I yeah, was just yeah. like. That's like day know, one but, stuff. Like you, like you see any UXO, you just leave it alone. You know, <laughs> that's just. You know, but there was rock eye. I mean, rock eye laying all over the place. Oh my I God. mean, it looked like John Knipe had been over there dropping weapons again, you know. <laughs> But that's yet another reason why you guys shouldn't have went out. Like, going back to that other story, like, who knows what you could have been driving through. I've heard guys tell that it's, it was just littered with, like you said, like, blown up tanks and depleted uraniums everywhere and just, you know, just a mess. I remember our XO, and I've run into my the XO from the battalion a couple of times in industry. You know, turret, you know, pulling up on a tank, it doesn't look like he's hit, dropping a thermite in, and as we're driving it off, the tank's just cooking off. You know, it, it was really was the wild, wild west at some points of this. I mean, yeah. it was very controlled. Don't get me wrong. The aggression was controlled. And that's one thing, you know, for us to be proud of is they did. We did what we had to do. Uh, but, you know, it was just it was there was too much time on hand at some points. Yeah. But. You know, to your, it was still a war. Like a lot of people kind of downplayed Desert Storm because it was only 100 hours, but it was still a war. You guys were still in harm's way. You were still fighting, you know, another a pretty formidable force. I mean, it was a war zone. And so, I mean, the thing like we're, the way the professionalism of your unit and everybody else that went over there is, I think, is commendable. You know what I mean? I think the, I think you guys went over there and did it right. Like, kind of like you said, it was controlled aggression. And the other, you know, the Iraqis didn't know what hit them. Did you guys have any, um, uh, were was in? Were there any rumblings of like, let's keep on going? Uh, you know, you always hear about wanting to go down to Iraq and just kind of finish it there. And yeah, so we were actually so we went over as a roundout brigade for first calf. 
Okay. So Tiger Brigade's what we were called. We got chopped to Second Marine Division. So Second Marine Division went straight up, and I mean, literally, when we showed up to Second Marine Division, we gave them sixty-six percent more firepower. Yeah. You know, they were still running around with them sixty-eight threes and stuff like that. But I mean, yeah, there was. Why did we stop? Why didn't we just continue on? Uh, you know, and that's you know, much like going into Afghanistan. I mean, when I showed up over there, they were transitioning. You know, about three months in the deployment, we transitioned from a kinetic to a nation building war. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a political decision. We were just there to execute. Uh, you know, in my opinion, we probably started that a little bit early. Yeah. Um, you know, same thing there. You know, could we have changed the whole face of the Middle East if we had continued on? Yeah. Or would it have created another void in power? Yeah, I mean... We would just had what we have right now kind of earlier, though, don't you think? Maybe, yeah, yeah, probably so. <laughs> okay, so you got back. Uh, was there any so it was pretty uneventful after that? After uh, after Dietz told you almost blew himself up, yeah. So guys... I actually got back here's I got back on my third anniversary. Uh, I okay. mean, literally, you made it, made my wife, met my wife on our third anniversary. Now, you know, from a personal note, and you know anybody has had kids, you know, and you've been away from them for a while, you know, I picked up my daughter from a friend of mine, you know, arms, and she looked at me and screamed and dove out of my arms. It's a pretty gut wrenching, you know, thing, but yeah. Uh, no, I got back, uh, literally forest waters, chief waters, um, met me. He was the, um, NCOC of two tank at the time. At the, right before we left, I had orders to go to bomb holder, Germany. Uh, and I requested to extend the orders 90 days or get them canceled. They canceled them. So walk off the airplane, see my wife, Forrest comes up to me and he's like, hey, good news, you're going to Germany. I'm like, really? Where? And he goes, headquarters 17th Air Force. And I'm like, what? <laughs> you got to be kidding me. So, yeah, and supposed to, you know, supposed to have like four or five months, uh, got called. You know, said, hey, we need you here earlier. And so we packed up, moved over. I, I went over first, uh, left Amy with her parents and my parents with the baby. Kind of got the house set up and came in. Um, it was an interesting transition to go from a battalion level fighting a war to a headquarters. Yeah. And this was under, this was when Merrill McPeak was the chief of staff of the Air Force. So okay. it was... Um, I think I put on there uh, the Jason face mask. Tell me about it. <laughs> so Frank Arnold uh, was working there um, at 17th, and we were the training and stand about section for the TACPs in Europe. Mm -hmm. Well, Frank gave me a Jason hockey mask, <laughs> and I still haven't. I still didn't have my household goods, so I, I brought BDUs on purpose because the uniform of the day was blues Monday through Thursday and then BDUs on Friday. Our DO at the time was an old F 15 C pilot, Craig guy, you know, funny. He, we were always the first ones in the building. We always had coffee. He comes in. This was, you know, during the time when you had to go down and actually get the message traffic, mm -hmm. the classified and unclassified and read through it to see what was going on. Uh, the Colonel comes walk in and I've got the hockey mask on and it's, <laughs> it's literally says DOY shit screen. And he walks by and I'm sitting there with the hockey mask on reading the <laughs> messages and he goes and pours a cup of coffee, turns back around. And he goes, I know better than coming here first thing in the morning. And I'm like, yeah, you probably should, sir. He goes, I'm yeah. out. And he walks out. But, you know, it was a, as a, and I was a staff sergeant at the time, as a staff sergeant, while it was not, an operational assignment it set me up for success on a lot of other things understanding the inner workings of the headquarters what it takes to get decisions made understanding manpower documents utc documents and things like that uh, so it was it was a good assignment uh, good people mike uh, mike Britton came in to replace frank arnold was there the whole time with me nice um so yeah. A lot of people kind of discount that experience as a younger, you know, NCO 
But like you said, you don't realize the, the, the effect it's going to have on you later on down the line. I'm sure when you get in those leadership positions, you're like, oh, yeah, this is I know all about this stuff already. You know, it's just or at least I know somebody to call. So. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but yes, I was supposed to stay in Germany, actually go take John Uhlenhaeg's place at um, or take Max Porce's place at Grafenbeer mm -hmm. on the range. And, you know, my wife has uh, has battled Crohn's disease her whole life and um we had we went down and found a doctor and all that so i curtail my d rows so i me and max could have some overlap and like 15 days before i was supposed to leave the youth safety surgeon general denied my efmp and i had the pcs from germany in 15 days oh my god to <laughs> Fort Polk, Louisiana, and I'll say Fort Puke, Louisiana, because I grew up an hour south of there. Yeah. Uh, but that was an interesting time. So, um, you know, I got the Fort Polk, 21st day sauce, you know, again, small unit. Um, Frank Arnold was there again. H.R. Uh, Williams was there. Um, good, fun, small unit uh, supporting second instead of armored cavalry regiment it was the army cavalry regiment light okay um but you know you walked into that regimental headquarters and you know they would have all their former regimental commanders and it, dude it was the who's who of the army back in the 80s and 90s and stuff it was yeah. you know former chief of staff former you know ucom commander blah 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 it was like wow uh, and they're their conference room was their heritage room. And I mean, just unbelievable. Some of the heritage, cause it was the longest flagged unit on active duty. Really? I mean, it had its beginnings in, around the Seminole wars and stuff like that. So, wow. you know, there was saddles that were presented by former, you know, um, regimental commanders all the way back. But, um, wow. that was pretty interesting. Um, you know, actually, so did a deployment to Kuwait from there with Troy Lundquist, Max Porras, Martin Jolly, another one, the rest of the soul, yeah. guy named Rob Nix, a few others. We were supposed to be there for like 30 days, ended up there almost like 120 days. Jeez. Uh, you know, um, basically the whole, the, you know, Saddam was rattling his sabers again. The whole thing was we had missions every day on Udari. Oh, okay. um, and Ed Modica was there when we were over there and Colonel Modica's only rule was he didn't care what we did as long as we were on the range when we need to be on the range. Sure. Um, SEALs SF teams would come in turn their vehicles over to us. So we, instead of having one vehicle, you know, non-tactical vehicle for the whole outfit, we, everybody had their own non-tactical almost. Nice. They turned their ammo into us. So, you know, we go out to the range, you know, and just burn through ammo, um, you know, set up our own firing ranges and all that. Uh, visited the Kuwait or the U.S. Embassy. Uh, I won't say we were asked to leave, but we may have been asked to leave <laughs> on beer and movie night. Um, and then, you know, left there and went to the schoolhouse. Um, started off teaching seven level there, got pulled into... Probably the most interesting time in my military career was the acting first sergeant at the schoolhouse. Oh my God. My real gig was the CDC writer, but acting first sergeant. Sure. So I left there. I had a autographed copy of the commander and the law from the legal office. I'm sure they kept but, you busy. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, it was never a quiet weekend. Um, Jeez. you know, and then it'll be in the superintendent of the schoolhouse. Um, I'll never forget, I was on the phone with Steve Burroughs. This was when the office uh, for TACP was outside the Pentagon. It was in Crystal City. And Steve's like, e -e, you need to go check your TV. I'm late for a meeting. That was the morning, the 9-11. And oh. uh, Steve's like, I missed the bus to my meeting. And um, the plane crashed into the Pentagon. Wow. So, but I mean, that day... You know, I remember walking into the classrooms and telling the students, you know, we're going to shut down training for today. You need to go watch what's going on yeah. and understand the implications for what's going on. Yeah. Um, so 
but yeah, Schoolhouse was a blast. Great group of instructors, bunch of knucklehead students, but um, <laughs> there was some good ones that have come through. I mean, when I look, you know, at some of the former students right now, you know, James Barker's the ACC functional manager. Um, you know, um, oh man, John Stockman's at the 14th. You know, he's been a former group, you know, group chief. Um, you know, Adam Beasy was one of the instructors there with me, worked with me in Hawaii, retired as the, you know, second Air Force command chief. Um, yeah. It's just, it's incredible to see what. You know, when I came in and do we walked on the shoulders of giants. If you, if, you know, if you go back into the history and, um, you know, one of the best officers I ever worked for in the Air Force was the commander of the schoolhouse when I first got there, a guy named Mike Mayer. Um, best leader I ever worked for in the Air Force as an officer. Uh, Mike was a gunship fire control officer, you know, knew the community, did so much to smooth out the rough area that the schoolhouse was going through just prior to that and get us on, you know, kilter where Kiesel would leave us alone to train the students and, you know, things like that. But, you know, that, um, that period of time was very influential to me um, because I knew I was getting toward the end of my career, but, you know, I go back and look at, like I said, guys that trained me, Doug Tillman, you know, Randy Long, Johnny Cleaver, and all those were instructors at the schoolhouse and see what they did out in the community, yeah. you know, to do that. Guys like Mark Bellella, Mar Marty Klukas, Eric Kibbe, you know, guys that I grew up with in the community are just, you know, I hope the history is never forgotten. Yeah. You know, and where we got our start was actually, and Major Mayor actually had us uh, research, it was the Rover Joes during World War II. They were Army guys that would go out and call in targets. Really? Um, you know, it never became official until, you know, the 70s. But, you know, those guys laid a path for us. And where it's going now, who knows? Yeah. Um, but it's pretty crazy. Yeah, it's really cool. Yeah, they're, I think they're um... – they're even come branching off into a different kind of uh, mission set now. So it's, it, it's interesting to see where all that's going to, going to end up. Kind of like you were talking about with the HF stuff. I mean, that's, I think yeah. that's a, a key part of it. But dude, last, I mean, and I got to say this, my last assignment, you know, schoolhouse was great. Uh, the last assignment was Hawaii. <laughs> and you know, it's funny you walk in the door that, is, you know, I walk in the door and 95% of the people there were former students. Oh, yeah. <laughs> to include both brigadians who I sees, but you know, Eric Kibbe was there. He was uh, an instructor with me down at the schoolhouse, and I, you know, Eric and I grew up throughout the same period. Uh, Kenny Lindsay was there. You know, we ended up with John Knight, uh, Brian Reynolds. I can honestly say, you know, every assignment has its good points, but Hawaii was probably the best assignment I ever had. Yeah. Uh, and it wasn't because of the unit, it was because of the people that were in the unit. Yeah. And, you know, you, you look at the success out of those guys in that unit, um, it's absolutely incredible what they've accomplished. I mean, you know, Brian Reynolds ended up at uh, supporting 2-4. Mm -hmm. um, George Earhart, I don't know if you know George. Yep. George another one uh, that was in that unit as a young staff sergeant. Adam Vesey, um, you know, was there. John Knight came in. Um, um, geez, yeah, I'll forget a bunch. Frobachino, you know, there's just from the young guys all the way up were just incredible. They would do anything you ask of them, and um, nine times out of ten, doing it with a smile on their face because they were in Hawaii. Right. <laughs> yeah, so, I've never heard anything bad about the the Hawaii unit. The 25th always seems to be seem to be really squared away. I mean, and I think it's like. Kind of like the 82nd maybe, um, but like you, the guys you had there, like yourself, it's just the turnover of good guys, you know, the overlap of good guys would, I think, made that kind of work. You know what I mean? Like you just had a constant rotation of good dudes that rotated in and out of there. And, uh, you know, the mentoring that you gave and the guys before you and the guys after like Kenny and all those guys. And then they'd take that in somewhere else. But, yeah, 20, the, the, that unit has always been top notch for sure. Well, I, I rolled in and replaced Valella. Oh, there you go. Perfect. Yeah, so, example, I mean, yeah. you know, I had a 
I had a continuity book sitting on my desk from V, you know, and it was like, you need to do this, this, and this. If you do these three things within your first 90 days, you will be successful. And it was because we had a new op sergeant major, a new command sergeant major, and a new commander from the army. And it's yeah. like, get to know them. And they treated me like one of their own. And, I, you know, that's a, a good thing in the... You know, we walked off the airplane in uh, Afghanistan in 04. I mean, we actually had sent a brigade to Iraq and the division and a brigade to Afghanistan. So we were, we actually were part of our unit was deployed. And I mean, this, no, no, I don't want to hear, you know, I'm not saying this because the Rangers have been deployed constantly since 2000, you know, but we had, you know, we were fenced off for a while. Yeah because we were a PACOM asset, um, but we were gone for 18 months, part of the unit. And I mean, it was in the constant rotation, but we got off the airplane in, uh, at Bagram and the op sergeant major goes, Hey, Jason, I know you guys are supposed to stay on the air force base on the air force compound, but if it doesn't work out, we've got a complete B hut for you guys. And then your staff sergeant, I had a female admin staff sergeant. He goes, I'll put her with my senior NCOs. And it was a relation type thing, you know, That's where awesome. they took care of us and we took care of them. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, tell me about that. Tell me about that, that, uh, rotation there. You got a couple of things listed here. They're just fascinating. I'd, I'd like to hear about them all for what the first thing you had the IED task force. Well, tell me about that. Tell me what, what you guys did with that. So I was still, I still had all my currencies and my status. So, um, we were still in the, circus tent said Bagram. It was like day three and these three guys walk in and they're all in civilian clothes. And this one dude, he's got a beard, dark hair, kind of turns around and looks at me and he turns around and looks at me again while he's walking up front and like Colonel sitting, you know, a Shrum sitting next to me. I'm like, dude, I owe him money or something. <laughs> well, they, they go up and they talk to the CG and the CG points back to us and he goes, you know, says something to him, they come walking back toward us. And this guy's still just eyeballing me. And I'm like, I literally said to him, I'm like, dude, do I owe you money? <laughs> and he asked me, he goes, hey, do you know my brother? And I'm like, I don't know you. How do I know your brother? <laughs> and it, his brother was uh, Wilborn out of the Georgia Guard. Oh, okay. So it, this guy's name's Tommy Wilborn. He's, I think he's a two-time Ranger Hall of Famer and all that. He's now working for this IED task force. And he goes, hey, the CG said we can have you for a couple of weeks. Do you got civilian clothes? And I'm like, yeah. And my colonel's like, whoa, whoa, wait, wait a second. What do you mean you can have him for a couple of weeks? <laughs> so it was a bunch of former CAG dudes that were on the IED task force. And they're like, meet us here with uh, your radio, your weapon, and in civilian clothes. So we drove around the country in two non-tactical vehicles and tell you the truth i felt safer with that than i did you know most other times sure and every place we stopped there was a former cag dude there you know as part of whatever we stopped at you know the afghani secret service training facility this training facility and all it was was they were making routes knowing that ieds were coming yeah uh and checking out you know all this so um fun time i mean you know it was it was just interesting i mean like i said this dude walks in and starts staring at me and i'm like but you know small world his brother's a retired georgia attack p that's crazy so, yeah so so the task force was it to um kind of find out that who was making them or just prepare for they were just preparing for it. they were just i mean you know, we'd started seeing the IEDs in Iraq. They knew it was going to flow down, so they wanted to get stuff set up. And they actually evaluate the IED sites also to understand okay. what they're using and everything else. So I think one of the dudes was former agency guy, you know, you know, there was several different groupings within that. But yeah. this was, I think this was more their L&O uh, lead up to set places that they could base out of. Oh, okay. That's cool. I mean, anytime you do stuff like that, it's really cool. Kind of get out of your comfort zone a little bit and see yeah. some see some different stuff. That's really neat. Um, so what about you said something about dealing with the ace? Tell me about that. Oh, so uh, 
we got there, you know, 10th Mountain was rotating out. The ace that was there was rotating out. They brought in a guy named General Hunt. Uh, his call sign was Beak. He was an old F-117 pilot, ball-headed guy. He was he was a great dude, man. He was okay. funny and all that. Well, there was three interactions that I had with him that just stick out to the back of my mind. And the Army had made Bagram Manhattan salute area. That was the edict that was put out. So we're going to fly out. The general hunt is going out to bomb in and you know, there was there was starting to be a lot of places where there was no JTAGs. So we had rode an in extremist cast plan, which were basically concentrable rounds. And we wrote a script for anybody that could get a hold of an airplane, you know, to say, Hey, you know, I'm here, I'm not a JTAC, here's the target, you know, based off of our position, if you have X, can you expend it? You know, just PRTs, you know, stuff like that that didn't have anything. So we were going out to brief that at bomb him with the ace. And, you know, and I told my guys, because we were going out to visit a New, Eng- a New Zealand PRT, I had no idea what they were, you know, what they had. So I told the colonel and the major and all that, we're carrying our long guns. You know, you're not just carrying a pistol, you're going to carry your long guns and your kit. And I had a radio with me. So I go come walking up and General Hunt is sitting on the back of his uh, suburban with the tailgate down, swinging his legs. And he goes, what's up, Boy Scout? And I'm like, sir? He goes, well, what's all this about? And I'm like, well, you don't have a security detail. So, you know, if something happens, we're going to do what we can. He goes, well, what do you mean? I'm like, if something goes down and one of us grabs you and pushes you, go where we push you. Yeah. And he's like, what if I don't? <laughs> and... I felt Colonel Shrum's hand grab the back of my collar and I'm like, sir, I'll butt stroke you. <laughs> and he goes, you wouldn't dare. And I'm like, think about it. An E8 butt stroke in an 07, nothing's going to happen to the E8. He goes, you would. And I'm like, yeah, in a heartbeat. And so <laughs> next, next couple of days, he'd come down and he goes, hey, I'm flying out here. Do you want to go with me? And I'm like, you got to ask Colonel Shrum. And Colonel Strum said yes the first day. And then, you know, after that, he'd say no. But I got tapped um, also to go out with. So General Olson used me as a, an extra JTAC. He put me out with whoever. So he put me out with the long range surveillance team for about 60 days. Got pulled back in from that. Um, then there was a. There was some green on green stuff and happened in the middle of the country, a place called Chacharon. So he put me on a bird to go up there, landed, and we did it, it, literally a 29 hour convoy with A and A. You know the army, uh, the army embedded training team, all that stuff. We got to this place. Um, it was an old abandoned, uh, Russian airfield, you know, we were there, I was there for like 40 days. Um, <laughs> the only place you could do your laundry and bathe was in the river. So it was a Friday. It's like right before July 4th, I'm looking at the river. I wade out to the middle of, it and it gets about neck deep and it's moving pretty good. So I'm like, Hey, I got an idea. I go up to the embedded training teams, the vehicle maintenance chief. And said, "Hey, give me four inner tubes." <laughs> so we put we put a gun truck on one side of the river, and then you know a tactical, a non-tactical with a weapon on the other side, and we jumped in the river, went tubing, and then we swapped out. <laughs> well, awesome. I get I get back to Bagram. I get pulled back because the <laughs> Marines that have been doing Karzai's QRF were being rotated out with the National Guard unit. They didn't have a JTAC, so. They asked, you know, I was told I was going to pick that up and, you know, and um, I get back and I go up to General Hunt's staff meeting the first day and he goes, hey, Jason, I heard it was pretty up there. Did you take any pictures? I'm like, yes, sir. And I threw him a thumb drive. <laughs> this was before thumb drives were banned. Sure, sure. And he made a, uh, his wife had given this nice cappuccino maker and um, he's like, go make you a coffee. And all of a sudden I hear, Wallace, get your... In, in here and I'm right. like oh what did I leave on the thumb drive 
No. I walk in and he spins the monitor and it's me tubing. <laughs> and he's like in a combat zone. And I'm like, the only thing I could think of is, sir, we had security out on both sides. Yeah. So funny story is I ran into General Hunt. He was the youth safety A3 mm. about four years after I retired. I was working for ABP and we were doing a little trade show there and, uh, they would walk around and let each vendor introduce themselves for a minute. And I get through with the introduction. I've got this army guy, former uh, Sakir Sigdet first sergeant that I travel with all the time. And um, <laughs> I see this ball of head and I don't think anything about it. And all of a sudden I see two stars standing in front of me and it's General Hunt. And he's like, been tubing in any combat zones. I'm like, negative, sir. He goes, meet me downstairs in about five minutes. We're going to drink some beer. And I'm like, I'll, I'll be there. So. <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> um, tell me about this out of the box cast. Like I, I'm always interested to hear about how, you know, people control air overseas and the different techniques, you know, and it's, this kind of caught my eye. So yeah. Tell me about that. So I just got back from that, that trip and, um, uh, the embedded training team that I was with, so we'd, we'd shaken down a couple of warlords. And when I say shaking them down, we basically told them either stop or we're going to, you know, your house is going to disappear and stuff <laughs> like that. Well, the warlords have been pretty compliant in that area. Well, the embedded training team was going out to visit the warlord. And all of a sudden, two vehicles came up brandishing weapons. So they took down one of the vehicles and put him back in Chacharan, you know, the, the people in the vehicle back in Chacharan and then proceeded out. Well, on the route out to this warlord's house, you came down this, you get, you got in this valley where you had to ford a river and then go up on the other side and it got pretty barren. Well, they were, they had a, um, two non-tacticals and a turtle shell Humvee, but it wasn't an up armored Humvee with MPs and that up armored Humvee had a 50 on it. Or maybe it was a 240. I can't remember. But that was their heaviest weapon. So as they started to get ready to ford the river, they started taking plunging fire from the other side up top. And it hit the commo truck, blew it up. Oh, my God. The um, One of the guys, um, he was a scout. He's training their scouts. He got in the river behind a rock and got pinned down. Um the up arm, I mean, the Humvee had, was taking some serious rounds. A couple of dudes, minor wounds. I mean, like one dude had a piece of an AK actually get inside of his Kevlar and spin around and cut him. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, they were pretty much pinned down. When the combo truck blew up, they had a Thoriah cell phone, so they called the operations desk and declared a tick. So Chops calls me down, hands me the phone, so I now got the phone in my ear trying to list J2's pulling up maps on the screens, making it, you know, making it look like I'm looking at from their position, you know, from their position, or I can move back to the A10s. Well, well the cap cast was a, uh, a B1. Mm. We sent them there. They went full burner and ran out of gas. Jeez. So the A-10s get up there. We can't talk to the A-10s at that time because they didn't have the pods that had the SATCOM radio. So right. we had to relay via SATCOM to the B-1s. The B-1s relayed to the A-10s. So I'm literally with the relaying to the B-1s, looking at a map, talking to the guys on the phone with the RIA. And that's why I said it was pretty much out of the box. But we yeah. ended up running two strafe runs down there. I got in trouble with General Hunt on that one, too, because there was a bunch of chirping going on behind me. And I basically told him, if you don't have a effing position in this fight, shut up and get out of the AO. Yeah. And I look up and General Hunt just tells me that I just told that to the CG of the 25th because he was the one behind there. But well, he should know better. I mean, he's yeah. uh, he's been around the block. He should know better than that. So they, they strafed a couple of times on that ridge line, and, and we didn't target them directly. We just kind of started trying to walk them back. Uh, like after the, the after lead made his second run, the phone rang from the Afghan 
you know, Secretary of Defense, hey, you know, they're going to back off. So um, the next day, a guy named Goldie Hawn, he was an A-10 pilot out of Alaska, came over to us and said, you know, ask us if we had a sat phone. So literally we gave him our um, MR sat phone and Goldie started playing around with could they in CapCast pull a sat phone and be able to talk on it to the guys on the ground. So they, you know, guys were experimenting over there constantly on how oh, they could sure. do things better. So they ever get so it figured out or his comms guys were able to plug something in and tie it into his, uh, his earpiece. So That's he was awesome. able to hear, it was just a, it, it was a band aid day. You know, they ended up getting the, what well, they get the lantern pods with the SATCOM in them later on or something along those lines. Yeah. So they actually had SATCOM capability moving forward. But. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. But that's that's what we do, man. That's the, that's a very good illustration of making it work with what you have. I mean, you just you know instead of you you very easily could have been like, I said we're out of luck. We don't have any. You know, we can't do it. But you figured it out. And that's really awesome. Well, they, when they get when those guys came back, and then, then we got we actually got the the uh, three guys that were in the Humvee there. They brought that Humvee to show the A-10s. Oh, yeah. And that, that, that thing was shot up uh, pretty good. So so then uh, tell me about um, – so you got back. I mean, you, this is kind of – you said that Hawaii was your last assignment. Yep. Um, and then uh, at some point you decided, you know, it's time to get out. It's time to, time to retire. Um, but uh, somebody that we both know that we actually lost recently – I uh, wasn't too happy with it. Mitch Quinn had a, had beef with you about that, or yeah. So I, I didn't tell. I mean, the background on that was, you know, I'm getting ready. I, I'm ready to PCS. I'm ready to go on. Um, I call the call up the community and say, hey, what's open? And I get told pretty flat out. I, I volunteered. You know, this was when you had your whatever that thing was called, your wish list or whatever. Yeah. Um. I volunteered for Fort Hood and I was testing for chief uh, figured, you know, I had a decent shot at making it. Um, I volunteered for Fort Hood. The functional at the time called me and said, no, we're going to move you to Fort Riley. You'll make chief and then we'll move you again within a year of that. And I'm sitting there looking at my oldest daughter, you know, coming down the stairs and she's going to, when we leave Hawaii, she's going to be a junior in high school, you know? And I mean, I've asked my family to sacrifice multiple times, you know, deployment, you know, moving around, all that type of stuff. And I'm like, I'm not. So we sat down and had a family discussion. And I'm like, you know, we came to the conclusion. Maybe it was time for us to, you know, move on to something else. So I didn't talk to Mitch. I just dropped my papers. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so we were at the, you know, we were at the barracks doing, you know, typical Air Force stuff, doing a barracks cleanup and my cell phone rings and I, I see it's Mitch. So I push it straight to voicemail. <laughs> Cause you and, probably knew uh, what it was about. No, I didn't. Oh, you didn't. You okay. know, I'm just like, I'm, I'm not in the mood to talk right now. I actually, I, in the back of my mind, I kind of thought what it was about. Well, he calls back immediately. I still, we still had guys down range. Mm. So I'm like, eh, I probably should answer this. And you know, typical Mitch okay, and loving and missing. Yeah. Same. <laughs> dude he just lays into me he is chewing me up one side down the other and that's what he would do you know if he needed to vent while he was over there and then i'd let him go for a while and i'd be like okay mitch are you done he goes god damn it don't call me mitch i'm chief i'm like whatever mitch i've known you forever <laughs> you know but i'm like i'm like what and he goes i'm not allowing you to retire and i'm like not your choice yeah. and i'm like i said i've asked you know, for, I asked this and this is what I told. So I just, he goes, well, aren't you going TDY? And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to Vegas for a couple of weeks to do a three one rewrite. And he goes, well, I'm going to hold it until then. Just think about it. I'm like, all right, I'll give you that. Hmm. So I'm in Vegas running to Drew Ford there. And me and Drew go play three card poker and win like two grand in 30 minutes. <laughs> I'm having a blast next night. I'm supposed to meet Drew again, go downtown George Earhart and a couple of dudes are graduating from um, JFCC get pickpocketed. So finally get back on base. 
going through all the phone calls and all that. And I, after I've called the last credit card or whatever I had to do, I picked up the phone, called Mitch and like, sign them now. I'm done. <laughs> so literally he signs them. And then I get a phone call because I asked for a nine month curtailment. Um, and you may have met her or whatever. The functional at the time at AFPC was a one Charlie five named Joanne Pace, Chief Pace. I was an acting first sergeant with her at Herbert. Oh, okay. Joe calls me and she's like, she starts the conversation off. Hey, Jason, how's it going? I'm like, what's up, Chief? She goes, well, she goes, I'm going to deny your retirement. And dude, I'm like, what? She goes, well, you asked for a nine month D Rose curtailment, but with no justification. I'm like, Joe, I just came back from nine months deployed. And she's like, it's not documented. I'm like, oh, we're going to play games now. So I'm like, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll hang it out. I mean, I'll, I'll finish my D-Rose out. It'll give, give us time to get the unit handed over and all that. And she goes, you're going to make chief. Don't worry. I'm like, Joe, I'm really going to walk in and sign my name to the test. And she goes, no, you're not. And I'm like watch me so she called me the day of the test she goes what'd you do i said i walked in signed my name and walked out you know my wife's asked me a couple of times like at kenny's retirement or adam's retirement you know do i regret what i did no i don't i mean i i miss the dudes i miss the mission i don't miss the day-to-day bs yeah um you know and i mean i'm very lucky i still get to stay in contact with a lot of guys um I've been able to stabilize my family, get them, you know, going. Uh, I've got a daughter that's a nurse in Pensacola. I've got two. She's given me two grandkids, you know, one of them very early in my, you know, <laughs> life. And now, but I mean, I've enjoyed watching them grow up. I mean, my sure. granddaughter's 14. I get to go up and watch her play softball a couple times a week. She does weightlifting. Grandson's four years old. He's all boy. You know, my other daughter graduated school here and she's up. She just got married last, uh, last May. She's up in um, uh, Kansas in Wichita. So, you know, yeah, I miss the guys. I miss the mission, you know, but, you know, and I'll say it, I'll say it this in this form. It's not the same Air Force I joined. Yeah. So. But even even besides that, I I think you made the right decision because at the end of the day, they're they're for you. They're your family, and I think mm-hmm. ultimately family comes first. I mean, yeah, the mission when you're in there, when you're doing the mission, sure. But there, at some point, we all have to stop. You know, you can't do it forever. So I think you made the right decision. I I had a similar situation. It, it was like it, and I'm sure in your in in your situation, it was it was no um, decision at all. It was. My family is needs this, and, and especially with your daughter. I mean, you would have you would have moved as a junior, or she would have moved as a junior, and then you would have moved again, and she'd have had to start her senior year at some new school. Yep. Yeah, yeah, you made the right decision. I mean, it, I don't think anybody would ever fault you for that. And yeah, I mean, no, and I mean, you know, and that's what I tell guys now. I mean, you know, I tell guys to you're going to know when it's time to go. Yeah, um, for sure. And you know, and I, I'll tell you, I was waffling, and I mean, you know, you, you asked me about my other surgery. I go in. You know, one of my last trips, I did the pre-planning for Cobra, Coke Tiger and Cobra Gold. Mm-hmm. So I had been in Singapore and Thailand. I came back, started doing my uh, physical for retirement. And I told him to x-ray my right shoulder because I'd heard it in Afghanistan. And then, you know, Kenny Lindsay's famous, we're only going to do five push-ups. You know, I <laughs> face planted on the beach on one of those because it gave out. But, um, you know... There was, I'll, I'll just say God was looking out for me because, you know, I was starting to waffle and, you know, I think the decision was made for me because they found a mass in my chest, which turned out to be nothing. But 20 days before my retirement ceremony, I'm laying on an operating table for five and a half hours. Oh my God. Um, you know, and, um, you know, I've been able to provide for the family well now, you know, um, and like I said, I still get to stay in touch with the community, Sure. you know, through my jobs that I've had and everything else. And uh, it's been nice. I mean, yeah. you know. And it's a uh, different world now, like just with social media or communications. I mean, like it, it, when you get out of the military now, 
you you don't have to break ties with anybody. I mean, you can you could stay you know in contact with any whoever you want to. So, it's, you know, it's, funny you say that. The other day, I saw somebody comment. Russ Carpenter posted something. I saw this name comment. I'm like, I wonder if that's who I think it is. So I sent him a friend request, and he literally he sent me an, uh, an IM on Facebook and he goes, just to make sure this is who I think this is. Where did you pick me up on during this time period? Blah, blah, blah. And I knew as soon as he said that, who yeah. it was the guy I was thinking about. I, <laughs> like I picked you up from correctional custody at Keesler Air Force Base. <laughs> now this is a good, good news story. This kid did some, did some stupid. Mike Mara said, you've got a choice. He goes, you can take your punishment, go and do, Correctional custody, if you get through correctional custody, you start the schoolhouse day one, and your other is day one, phase one. This kid was such a solid performer after that, that Mike Merritt broke every AETC rule. He gave him the honor grad, and the kid deserved it. Nice. He's now a major in the Air National Guard, flying 130s. He also flies for American Airlines. And he, he made the comment, you know, we kind of exchanged IMs and he goes, do you, he goes, I don't know if you remember the tough love um, conversation we had on the way back from Keesler. He goes, but thank you. You know, that set me on the path I'm on. And I'm like, dude, that means more to me than anything. Any award anybody could have given me is that I had an impact on somebody. Definitely. Yeah. We talk about that quite a bit on here about how, if we hadn't had these mentors helping us out when we screwed up as young guys, we would never got to be where we are. And with that, without you, that dude could have had a whole different life. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. I just think we, I think we need to give young guys, these young airmen coming in. I mean, shoot, their brains aren't even developed till they're 25. So like you're, you're talking about 18 to 25, just sheer luck. They don't get in trouble. I mean, frankly, I mean, really. Well, you mentioned it, this right here, I wouldn't have survived my first enlistment if we'd had these. Oh, no way. No <laughs> <Yeah>. way. <laughs> All that recording. And I, oh, man. And I, yeah. and I think of some of the stuff, you know, even that we did, you know, even a senior in CEOs. Uh, yeah. You know, it's it's crazy. So Yeah. So you retired and you've done a ton of stuff. Do you want to go into any of that stuff? Kind of what, what you've been doing since you got out? Yeah, I'll touch on it. I mean, I... um. <laughs> it'll turn into a John Knipe story. So, um, you know, I was starting to get nervous. It was about March time period. Didn't have a job lined up yet. And, um, uh, I get this phone call and it's a dude with an accent and he's like, Hey, my name's blah, blah, blah. I own this company. I want to offer you a job. And I'm sitting there listening to it. And I'm like, I literally said to this guy three times, I'm like, John Knipe, if this is you, I'm going to grab a lead pipe and I'm going to drive down the road and I'm going to beat your ass. <laughs> well, it turned out to be the owner of the company, the first company I worked for, Automated Business Power, which did comm and power integration for single channel radios. So I did that for about 10 years. I mean, I was telling you, uh, Jim Simpson's a guy that uh, was a SOC year SIGDEC first sergeant, um, got out of the Army. Um had been selected for Sergeant Majors Academy. You know, me and him ran the roads for 10 years in Europe. You know, he had the Army east of the Mississippi, and I had the Air Force globally. So, you know, got to know him, his family, his his in-laws live uh, just outside of Stuttgart. Even when I go over there now, I make sure and go by and see him. You know, his father-in-law calls me a house frow and gives me a shot of snops and stuff like that. So, you know, again, you continue to make friends. Sure. But I did that for 10 years. Company did get in a little trouble, you know, with um, after sequestration. They're doing fine now, but you know, it's like it's an opportunity for me to break and grow. So, I applied for a job at at that point, Rockwell Collins, now Collins Aerospace. Ended up working with Blair Evans and uh, Charlie Heidel and a retired um, JSOC sergeant major named Cecil Hammonds. Uh, had fun there. Got to travel the globe. Um, doing that um some things happened there and i i took a chance my old next door neighbor who i played baseball against when i was 12 years old in the dixie's world series 
um, told me about this company and he wanted to bring me on board about uh, with them. Uh, great technology. Uh, basically, they with software can geo rectify full motion video off of UAVs to less than a meter targetable data. Nice. Uh, unfortunately, the dating period and the marriage period were two different things. So, um, left there, went to Cubic uh, Defense. Um, I've worked for their DTEC uh, Mission Solutions. We basically make um, deployable network gear. Uh, U.S. Army is one of our biggest customers. TACPs are actually getting that. Um, but uh, been there for three years. I lead the um, business development and sales team uh, globally for that right now. Nice. Um, use my GI Bill. Um, I, guys, you know, anybody listens to this use that gi bill and i mean and it doesn't have to be a degree uh, i did two programs i did a ucla executive education program during covid uh, it was the first um, remote uh, course it was absolutely invaluable uh, i did a year-long program at stanford um, that's called lead um, you know, got a lot out of that. And I got more, more day-to-day -day use with the UCLA stuff. The Stanford, there was 500 and some people in my cohort from all over the world. Uh, you know, in my cohort, there was actually the uh, CEO of Spurs Entertainment Group. So think about the San Antonio Spurs. Oh, okay. The CEO of that was in the, you know, and I mean, wow. you connect and, you know, we still WhatsApp channels and stuff to stay connected, bounce ideas off of people and all that. So, you know, that's one thing nobody can take from you is an education, whether it's a hard knocks education, you know, a certificate program or whatever, make sure you use that. Yeah. And that networking is invaluable too. So you, it, as you pursue these educational avenues, other professionals, other, you know, good guys are doing the same thing. So, not only are you gaining that knowledge from that program, but you're like, you're like you said, networking with all these dudes that are kind of like-minded and ambitious and can help in the future or you can help them or whatever. So, I mean, and that's again, you know, to any young dude out there that listens to this, you know, you got to take care of yourself. You got to network and you need to start networking now. Um, you know, if you're planning on getting out, you know, whether it be a retirement or whatever, invest in yourself. Uh, Dave Stilly just went, I, you know, Dave, uh, yeah. Dave's just retiring as a former enlisted tech P. He's retiring as an 06 group commander in the guard. Um, the guy I worked with at Collins Aerospace named Jason Anderson has got this program called Pre-Veteran. It's a pay to play, but it's like $500 and he'll teach you to break the mindset you have from the military and, you know, translate it into something you can use in the civilian space because we think differently. Um, you know, I've seen O sixes put in an application and I'm not picking on them, but they're like, I'm an executive. You may be in the air force, but you know, you come to the business side, do you understand profit and loss? Do you understand all these things? Right. You know, you've got that, executive mentality it'll take you some time to come in you know they do hire people like that but you know invest in yourself network uh you know and don't care how bad you, how bad of a dude you were in the military what medals you have on your chest whatever civilian sector is not going to knock on your door very right. very rarely let me rephrase that you got to sell yourself you know, just because you were a JTAC or whatever, you know, it was a flavor of the day. You can already see that that flavor of the day, even in the military, is starting to drop down because we're not in a conflict anymore. Right. So, you know, and I'm available for anybody that wants to talk on anything like that, you know, you know, helping you set up for success moving forward. I mean, I'm not saying that I've been fully successful, but... You know, there's guys that want to give back to the young dudes and make sure that they're set up for success as they move forward in the next chapter of their life. Sure. But your wealth of knowledge, too, because you've been in, you've kind of been in that business realm 
since 06, essentially. I mean, so you've, yeah. you've got a lot of experience in, you know, translating those uh, military skills into civilian speak and, you, you know, the ins and outs of all these industries. So yeah, you'd, you'd be a, you'd be a good resource for people, I think, for sure. Well, do you have anything you want to talk about as far as like um, any kind of initiatives or any kind of charities or anything like that? Do you do, you do anything well, kind of stuff like that? You know, TACP Association, TACP Foundation, I mean, uh, got a couple of pictures of, you know, when we when we really look to revamp it, you know, Charlie Lunk, Jason Zogeman, Buddy Mack, uh, Bowman, uh, you know, sitting on our back, my back porch when uh, after uh, Brad Smith, and, you know, was killed in action and saying we need to revamp this. And dude, I am just absolutely thrilled and amazed at where that organization has gone. So, yeah. uh, you know, shout out to all those dudes that are still working that, you know, keep pressing it. Um, work with the guy now. Uh, as a matter of fact, two weeks from now, we'll be down in Tampa for soft week. Um, uh, we, our company sponsors the, the Task Force Dagger silent auction. Nice. Uh, a couple of years ago, we helped raise over two hundred fifty thousand dollars in three hours. Jeez. <laughs> um, so you know, a guy named Mark Stevens, who's in the um, uh, SOCOM Hall of Fame, he was on the uh, Saddam mission where they pulled him out of the uh, spider hole. Wow. Um, dude's just—he's a legend in that community. Nicest guy you'll ever meet, too. So Mark was the executive director of Task Force Dagger. Um, and they do some cool stuff. Um, you know, they actually go out and they take former, you know, CAC dudes, you know, JSOC, all those guys, you know, dive qualified. They'll go out and do recovery missions or assist in recovery missions and stuff like that. So, huh. you know, uh, helping work with that, um, really just, you know, there's a couple other things I've got in the back background that I'm looking at, um, uh, you know, kind of stood up a little bit of a consulting company to help some small businesses and all that. Uh, because honestly, when I retire, if I'm under my wife's feet the whole time, she'll probably bury me in the backyard. So I need, to, and it actually keeps me mentally engaged also, sure. which is, you know, I think if you stay mentally sharp, I mean, our bodies are pretty broken, but if you stay mentally sharp, you're going to do well. Oh yeah, for sure. So pretty much it. I mean, like I said, I drive up, uh, drive about 45 minutes twice a week when I'm home to go watch my granddaughter play softball and watch my grandson roll around in the dirt. Um, <laughs> and that's the best time of my life. Uh, yeah. My parents just moved uh, closer to us. So that's good as they, you know, start getting up in the or getting older. I don't have to worry about driving seven hours to see them. So I'm yeah. enjoying spending time there. Well, good deal, man. That's good. I'm glad that you're, it, it seemed like you're in a great place. Like you seem like you have, you know, all your, your family around you and it's really, really working out for you. That's awesome. That's yeah. Good. Appreciate it. JD, man, I hope I haven't rambled too damn much for not you. Not at all. I, not, I know not, you're going to edit this, so. I'll, I'll cut it down a little bit, but not, not much. I mean, this was awesome. This is, this is fascinating. I, I'd love hearing, you know, guys that I, and even, you know, not just you, but like everybody I've had on, I've, I've had some, some sort of relationship with, but I, didn't know all this, all these stories. So it's fascinating to me to, to hear them all. So it's great. Yeah. Dude, there's, uh, there's so many, I mean, you know, the cool thing is just like everybody always says, you know, you, you, you link up. I mean, hell, I remember you guys coming down from the Rangers with jazz and all that. Y'all were going to some air show, picking up swag and stuff, hanging out in the office and yeah, crap yeah, like that. Right. And, you know, but I mean, honestly, we, you know, we talked about me and Van Pate have talked about it. You know, we could probably write a book just about the schoolhouse. Oh, easily. Yeah, I'm I mean, sure. The stupid shit that those kids did. <laughs> yeah. I, That's I, why I was like, this is, I said, if he goes into, when you say you were the first artist, I said, if he goes into all the shit he dealt with, we're going to have another whole episode. I guarantee you, <laughs> you know, it's going to be another did, hour. I, could, or... but I mean, the worst <laughs> one I remember, we were doing an MW, well, you know, we do MWR inspections time properly we would outfit our christmas party with booze with what we confiscated but we did one one night and again mike mara he um he went in and told cq to go tell everybody to fall out in the hallways and i'm standing outside with the cops osi and all that and as soon as that happens not five minutes later a girl walks out on the balcony so i send somebody up to get her bring her down 
She hands me her ID card, and I look at her ID card, and I'm like, Hey, Major Merrick, come here. Oh, no. I hand the ID card, and he goes, You're bringing her home. It was maintenance supports group's daughter's, uh, commander's daughter. Oh, my God. So you can imagine me walking up, and you know all he sees is a beret. I knock on his door, and I'm standing there with his daughter, and he looks at his daughter, looks at me, looks at his daughter, and I'm like, I said to him, I'm like, keep your daughter out of my barracks. <laughs> and started to walk off, and he goes, you? And I'm like, yeah, me, Major Mara will be in your office tomorrow morning. He goes, and you? And I'm like, I would, dude, that was the worst night. Yeah, but I mean, but, I mean, how can he get mad at you though? I mean, it's not—it's not like you—you you can't stand guard at the door and make sure they don't bring these people in. I mean, it's like, hey, how about you parent your kid instead of blaming my students for you know trying to hook yeah, up? No kidding. You know? But anyway, so, you're down in Fort Walton Beach, right? Yeah, I'm down in the bar. We got Slyke here. We got Tommy Case here now. Yeah, yeah, you got that's. Uh, I mean, there's like tons of guys down there. Adam Veazey's down here now. John Knipe's got a part-time house down here. That's what he said. Yeah, I was talking to him the other day. Well, so, you know, John's John was on a video. I don't know if he still is over at the Army Museum. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I saw it. <laughs> well, so I saw it, and I called him, and I'm like, how long did they take you to shoot that? Because, number one, you were sweating. Number two, you didn't say fuck one time. Right. <laughs> and he goes, yeah, it was a long shoot. So. <laughs> I saw him for the first time a couple of weeks ago when we did our uh, when we did our lunch. So, um, yeah, Clay Christian's down here, Buddy Wilborn, Buddy Mac. Yeah, um, I'd love to have all those guys on. So if those guys are willing, I'm I'd love to have them on for sure. All right, brother. I know I've wasted enough of your time this Not morning, but I appreciate awesome. catching up and I appreciate the honor of coming on this. Yeah, for sure. I can't thank you enough for coming on. I really appreciate it. And JD, keep in touch, man. Let me know if you need anything or, you know, <laughs> need a body to disappear or whatever. <laughs> okay, we'll do. All right, brother. Be good. All right, man. See you. See ya. Hey!